When the soul has been wounded and the sun is keen to surface in the dark, there is one place I go to, that place that fills the earth's land with moisture and water, that changes the coast in a dream, that place the ancients call mother of mothers, the ocean. John Puel, Ocean Song to Myself. To my YouTube channel. I'm Justina, creator of Bohemi Magic Studios, and today we are going to do a very special book review on this book I have right here. It's called Sea Magic by Sandra Kynes, Connecting with the Ocean's Energy. So today's video is in collaboration with another YouTuber slash Instagrammer that I met along my mermaid journey. Her name is Mermaid Jade, and she takes some beautiful underwater footage of herself as a mermaid. I am so excited to be sharing her footage with you today. You'll see it here and there in this video. Also, I wanna send a big thank you to all my Instagram friends and followers who have been joining me on my mermaid challenge throughout this month of July and I also want to thank all of my subscribers old and new for joining me on my month of mermaid madness here right here on my YouTube channel this is the last video in the series and I just want to wrap it up with this book review here so this is just a thank you for joining me on this journey with all the arts and crafts projects I've done this month I hope that you found them inspiring and I hope that you try any one of these craft projects and if you haven't seen any of those videos yet you can view them all in this uh, little info card section I will link my complete mermaid playlist in the description down below as well. So I'm just gonna read the back of this book really quickly for you guys just so you can get a feel of what the book is all about and you can pick it up if you'd like to. I am now an Amazon.com affiliate so if you click any of the links below to purchase this book today I will receive a little bit of commission so if you do I really appreciate it. This is called Sea Magic by Sandra Kynes and it's all about connecting with the ocean's energy. Invoke the power of the sea and transform your life. Purifying, mesmerizing, transformative. The sea has long been celebrated for its beauty and mysterious power. By connecting to the ocean's energies, you can deepen your experience of the natural world and enrich your life. Whether you live near or far from the coast, sea magic takes you on a unique voyage of spiritual rejuvenation. Explore its various types of shells and sea creatures, both real and mythical. Call upon sea deities and saints to amplify your spiritual practice and try a wide array of relaxation exercises and meditative techniques. So some of the things that this book goes through include setting up a sea-themed altar to empower your intentions, Center your energy with a cosmic ocean moon meditation and a conch hand mudra. Release emotions with an ancient practice known as ocean breath to attune to the tides. Use shells for divination and positive visualization. And select a sea fetch, also known as a totem animal, to take you on a shamanic journey. Dive into your inner world of emotions, imagination, and creativity, and let the sea's timeless wisdom guide you on your life path. So it's just a very cool book about all stuff involving the ocean and uh, some types of magic you could do to uh, tune into that ocean energy. One of the things that I really love about Sandra's approach to sea magic is that she really makes it a point that you could be of any religious path and uh, you could still apply sea magic to your belief system no matter what it is whether you're Catholic, Christian, pagan, whatever it is that you believe it doesn't matter you can use sea magic and apply it to anything that you believe. So I really love how open-minded she is in her approach to using sea magic in your everyday life. She breaks up up her uh, sections of her book with with beautiful quotes and beautiful imagery as well Let's see that it's a really pretty illustration but the first part of the book is basically an introduction and Sandra talks about her childhood and she would spend her summers on the Delaware coast in a cottage and um, she just goes into how she used to collect seashells and memorabilia. And there's a really interesting story where she talks about how she was working a job in New York City and how on her lunch break she would go into this mysterious or magical shop with all of these 
oceanic treasures and uh, later on she learned that it was the shop of Veronica Parker Johns, a mystery writer who also happened to be the grand dame of conchology in the New York area. She basically just goes into her whole past and like why she feels so called to the ocean and how she associates it with her name because her name is Sandra aka Sandy. It's a really cute introduction that she tells us a little bit of backstory about her inspiration behind this book. Now part one, The Call of the Ocean and whimsical illustration. She gives some exercises and things that you can do to get in touch with your ocean energy. There's some journaling exercises that you can do. Then she goes into some books that she's gotten that have inspired her ocean studies, specifically Dawn Grove's book, The Oceans, because she bought a used copy and she found an inscription at the front from a father to his son that says, most of this world is here, we should understand it. This is vitally important advice for our everyday experience in this world and I believe it is especially relevant for us who are seekers, who want to know more about ourselves, the natural world, and the mysteries that unfold it all. And really the ocean's all about those mysteries, those deep-seated emotions within our ourselves metaphorically speaking I think sea magic can also be a metaphor for exploring you know your inner psyche and the depths of your own personality and why you are the way you are and what makes you tick and all those certain things so I guess sea magic in a way can be associated with shadow work a little bit which is very interesting and she also gives you some techniques that you can do to uh, get in touch with with that part of yourself she gets into currents and waves like she explains like something called wave train that come frequently in threes. The last wave of a train is said to be the most powerful to the Celtic people. The third wave of a third group was a symbolically significant barrier. A Welsh sea poem tells of the dead being buried where the ninth wave breaks. To be banished beyond the ninth wave meant that you were an outcast. Beyond this point, however, high adventure began. This marked the magical boundary of the other world. Beyond the ninth wave, one had to rely on the power of wisdom, the power of ancestors, and the power of soul. I really love that passage. Also, she uh, tells us about an Irish myth, the Tuatha de Danann requested time to prepare for battle and asked the Milesians to withdraw the length of the nine waves from the shore and then return. With their foes at the magical boundary, the Danann were able to raise a mist that hid Ireland, or at least temporarily. It's pretty cool. So it tells you how to do a ninefold sea blessing. It gives you a seawater preparation, so basically a little incantation you could do over some seawater to bless it. Mother Ocean, from whom life flows, bless this water with your love and nurturing power your endless beauty and strength. For this, I am grateful, blessed be. But then there's also a ninefold sea blessing, which you can actually bless the seawater with. So it goes, a small way for my smile, a small way for my voice, a small way for my laughter, a small way for my choice, a small way for my sight, a small way for my wealth, a small way for my generosity, a small way for my health, a small way for my truth, mother ocean, I ask for nine waves, of grace upon me. So that's just a really pretty sea blessing. And uh, she goes into why sea salt is really good to use in your uh, sea magic. And then she goes into the words uh, salary, which I had no idea that the word salary came from this. But in the days of the Roman Empire, soldiers were given an allowance of salt called salarium. This payment was eventually made in currency instead of salt. However, the word led to our word salary, which was very interesting. I never knew that, but you learn something new every day. Then she goes into a whole technique called sea centering. Um, you can use this as a grounding and centering technique and it's also kind of like the feeling of meditation. So the difference is that we use the ocean rather than the earth as our focal point for energy, establishing a connection with the sea on a deeper inner level. Sea centering helps us find and pick up threads of ancient dialogue between humans and the sacred world. This is basically just getting in a rhythm with the tides. It helps us establish a connection with the sea. It tells you basically some of the items that you can gather to do this. You want to get in touch with all your senses, touch, taste, sound, scent, and sight. For touch, you can use a seashell or a dish of sand from a beach. Taste, dissolve a pinch of sea salt in a small glass of water. Sound, you could choose various seascapes accompanied by a piano or, you know, just really pretty oceanscapes. Scent, you can find something that's like a sea-scented candle or something. And then sight, you could use any picture of the sea or the shore that resonates with you or a, a photograph of your favorite beach or something. Just something that you can get in tune with the ocean. She 
tells you how to do C centering, which is really cool. It's kind of like a meditation. If you guys are interested in me kind of guiding you through a C centered meditation, let me know and maybe I could put something together. She talks about the oceanic realm of emotion and basically how emotions are related to the element of water and how working with C magic can bring us deeply into that area of our psyche, which I said before. So then she tells you how to do an ocean breath and the breath is like the tide coming in and going out again in a regular rhythm. Them. Begin by pretending to fog a mirror with your breath. Hold your hand a couple inches from your mouth and make a gentle <sighs> sound from the back of your throat as you exhale against your hand. Inhale the same way, making the same sound. So this definitely is a little tricky and it takes a little bit of practice, but it's supposed to be very calming. Then at the end, she goes into journal questions and some prompts that you can jot down in your journal and really reflect upon. And I think journaling is a big part of that inner work and channeling your inner emotions and getting in touch with your psyche. So some journal questions she goes through are, what does the word magic mean to you? What does water mean to you in general and ocean water specifically? What have you felt while watching the ocean? If you have never been to the ocean, what do you imagine you would feel? What sensations did you experience with the sea centering practice? Was it similar to feeling grounded or was there a clear difference for you? Part two, this is probably one of my favorite portions of the book, Myths, Deities, and Saints. And that's the cute little illustration. And in this section, there's literally pages and pages and pages. It's all alphabetically categorized of all the different sea gods and goddesses from all the different uh, cultures. From Eger of Norway all the way to Yu Kang of China. And some of the ones that she goes through in here are Yamanya, which you can see a little description of Ellie the Mer Priestess, giving us a little bit of information about that in my little altar video up here. And here is a beautiful picture of the sea goddess Yamanya. Her roots are in Nigeria. She is a sea goddess and patron spirit of fishermen whose traditions were carried to the New World, where she was also worshipped in Cuba and Brazil. Part of the Candombo religious and healing tradition, she was considered the ocean spirit. Yamanya was depicted adorned with a crescent moon walking on the waves. In Brazil, on New Year's Eve, altars dedicated to her were built on beaches. She's a really, really big one to work with, I think. She goes through the meaning of sirens and Poseidon, Aphrodite, Cleodna. Cleodna is probably one of my favorite ones because I was writing a little bit of a fan fiction about her. So I'm really, I really resonate with Cleodna and Neptune. So there's a lot of different gods and goddesses all throughout this portion of the book, so you could just basically read about all of them and see which ones resonate with you. One little tidbit that she gives us about working with sea deities and saints. Working with a sea god or goddess provides a way to connect with the sea's energy. It is not a form of worship. Ancient peoples created pantheons to put a human face on the world's mysteries, searching for logic and the inexplicable powers of nature. Similarly, working with a deity can link us with the vast energy, making it more tangible. Putting a human face on it helps us personalize our experience more. So she encourages us to learn about all the different deities and gods and goddesses of the ocean and making it a little more personal. And every one of these is a little bit different. No matter what culture or tradition you are celebrating, they all have something very unique and special about all of them. And it doesn't matter if the one that you resonate isn't specifically tied to your culture or tradition that you were brought up with. Maybe that was you in a past life. Maybe in a past life you were a different culture or tradition and that's why you resonate with what you resonate with. So at the end of this section about all the gods and goddesses, she gives us some journal questions and prompts that you can reflect upon in your journal. Do you think that myths serve any purpose for us in today's world? Why or why not? If you were a navigator in ancient times, would you have searched for the hidden lands, the otherworldly place just out of you? Are you drawn to learn more about a particular saint, deity, or pantheon? Which and why? Do you feel that working with the energy of a saint or deity might help or enhance your connection with the ocean's energy and ultimately further your inner journey? And if so, how? Now, part three of the book, Altars, Tools, and Divination. I really love this section because this is a little more visual and she tells you some visual things that you can do to uh, get in touch with that ocean energy. She tells you how to make a sea altar, which you guys can see the sea altar that I made up in this video in the info cards and I will also link it in the description down below. She tells you some things that you can place on your sea altar to make it more personal and special to you and some tools that you can add. She tells you some, some natural elements that you can use as tools, like how to use seashells as tools and you can use shells also for the cardinal directions like west, north, east, and south, 
West represents dusk and the element of water. North represents night and the element of earth. East represents dawn and the element of air. And South represents midday and the element of fire. And she tells you different shells that you can use for each. So for West, you can use a shell with the colors of the setting sun or one filled with water. For North, you can use a dark colored moon shell, a sand dollar or starfish. For East, you can use shells the color of the rising sun like a yellow or pink scallop, uh, which can represent radiant beams of light. And then the South, you can use a white clam shell the color of noonday sun, which can also serve as an incense burner. She tells you how to do a seashell cleansing and blessing. She gives you a little wave blessing right here, which is really cute. And I love this little illustration up here. Stand at the tie line and begin by saying, Mother Ocean, I call on you to bless these shells. Dip them into the water of three successive waves, saying one of the following lines for each wave. Mother Ocean, cleanse these with your foam. Mother Ocean, purify these with your salts. Mother Ocean, charge these with your magic. Then cup the shells in your hands and close your eyes. Take a few long, deep breaths and feel the power of the sea. And then end with, Mother Ocean, thank you for your flow of blessings. And then she does a little moon blessing of salt. Uh, you could set a jar of salt in the moonlight and say, Sister Moon, shining bright, as you guide the tides this night, purify the salt for me with the magic of the sea. So then she goes into how to create a sea circle of energy, which is really fun and interesting. Basically invoke the four directions in your circle with your jar or shell of seawater. Move around the carnal points at the boundary of your circle, beginning with the west. Sprinkle seawater on the floor or into a shell for that direction as you say the first line of the invocation. Then move clockwise to the north, east, and south as you say the subsequent lines. Vastness of the Pacific, power of the Atlantic, strength of the Mediterranean, calm of the sargasso. Place the jar or a shell of water on your altar and say, Spear of the seas, mother ocean, I call on you to bless the circle with your presence. As the sea encircles the earth, so too you hold this space sacred. Then there's, I guess it's Latin, tenet mare sal sapientia. The sea holds the salt of wisdom. I hope I said that correctly. For a simpler approach without the four directions, use these alternate words. Mother ocean, mother ocean, bring your pure energy. Cleanse this space for my purpose with the power of the sea. Or you can keep it even more simple and say power of ocean, power of sea, cleanse and purify this space for me. So you could do this when you do a sea centering or a meditation or a prayer or just simply sit in silence, create your sea circle and notice if it makes a difference for you. Then it tells you how to dissolve your sea circle. Say, circle ebb like tide to source, mother ocean guide my course. So then another section on oracular guidance and signs. So then she tells you how to practice divination with cowrie shells. So I guess like maybe like reading tea leaves or something like the sort. Seashell divination is concerned not only with seeking the truth but with bringing truth to a situation. It is intended to help us live our individual truth by learning more about who we are. In the words of the Oracle of Delphi, know thyself. So it tells you how to prepare the cowries, and I guess this is what they look like. I haven't read too much on this whole cowrie shell system yet. I've never tried this or heard of this before, but it seems like they compare it to runes. Also, I guess like reading tea leaves, you throw them and depending on how they land, you're supposed to read them. So I'm gonna read this section a little bit more before I try that out. And then it tells you how to interpret the cowries depending on how they land. It gives you uh, interpretations for numbers one through nine. I guess the different interpretations is if it lands on a one, uh, it's all about yourself, beginnings, creativity, independence, individuality, leadership, loneliness, originality, or willpower. Two is all about relationships, balance, division, duality, harmony, partnership, solidarity, and tolerance. Three is all about family, abundance, energy, family, fertility, fulfillment, self-expression. Four is all about community. Dedication, dependability, luck, manifestation, reality, stability, strength, and truth. Five is all about your purpose in life. Change, communication, curiosity, freedom, knowledge, logic, restlessness, search, and travel. Six is about service. Beauty, devotion, duty, equilibrium, fidelity, love, perfection, service, sympathy, and wholeness. Seven is the number of the heavens, so it's all about spirituality. The ethereal, faith, introspection otherworldly realms, religion, and spirituality. Eight is all about achievement, accomplishment, confidence, power, strength, success. And nine is about the higher self, charity, compassion, generosity, healing power, humanitarianism, and selflessness. So seashell divination functions as a tool for exploring our inner world. So I guess after you do this cowrie divination, there are some journaling questions here for you to reflect upon as well. Whether or not keeping an altar is a new experience for you, how do you feel about the objects that you place there. Has creating a sea circle served to amplify the energy of sacred space around your altar? If so, how did it feel? 
physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Do you believe that you have received oracular signs or messages? If so, what were they and how did you differentiate them as signs? And has working with seashell divination helped you focus on specific aspects of your life? Which aspects and to what extent? So these journal questions are not only about the seashell divination, it's also about all of the exercises in this whole chapter as a whole. So you can reflect on each aspect of the magic that you've been working with this whole time. So section four is all about seashells. It starts with this beautiful poem from Dante Gabriel Rossetti from The Sea Limits. Gather a shell from the strewn beach and listen at its lips. They sigh. The same desire and mystery, the echo of the whole sea's speech, and all mankind is thus at heart, not anything but what thou art, and earth, sea, man are all in each. As gifts from Mother Ocean, seashells offer a tantalizing promise of discovery. Their energy and beauty inspires us, making them perfect aids in sea magic. Seashells have been used for mundane and sacred purposes worldwide, so people collect them or they use them in their magic. And this has spanned all over the world, from Africa to Asia, the Americas, Australia, India, Europe, Middle East. Ancient people use them as kitchen utensils or general household tools, as well as for personal adornment and also as jewelry. It says shells were major bling for prehistoric people, and shells were also used as currency, as evidenced by cowries from the Indian Ocean found at ancient sites in the caves of southern France. So this whole section goes into shells and the different kinds of shells, like gastropods, bivalves, cephalopods, uh, it goes into seashell anatomy. Like this shit is in depth about seashells, okay? So if you want to know more about seashells, definitely check this out. Then it tells you the difference between a conch and a whelk. I've never heard of a whelk. I've heard of conches, those are very popular, um, but apparently there is a difference. It shows you the difference between a conch and a whelk and explains the whole difference. And then it goes into abalone. If you play guitar, some of you might notice that some of the inlay, sometimes the fret markers on a guitar are abalone inlay. I really love abalone and guitars. I think it's really pretty. So then it goes into like the different types of shells, like the angel wing, the ark, the auger, the bear's paw, the carrier, cockles, conches. So you get the point. So a cowrie, so yeah, these are the cowries that we were talking about before in the divination. So there's different kinds of shells and you can use those for different kinds of purposes. So check this section out if you want to know more about seashells. And then at the end of this section, there's also journal questions as usual. Why do you think people are fascinated with seashells? What is your experience when meditating with a shell? If there's a particular type of shell that attracts you, what is it and why might that be? Can you visualize a walk along the beach collecting as many shells as you can carry and how would that feel? I guess mostly for people who can't really get to the beach, who maybe live a little more inland and it's harder for them to get around to experiencing all the ocean magic. In chapter 5, Sea Fetches, Totem Animals, and Mythical Sea Creatures. What happens in actual experience is that while people are often expecting little butterfly people or perhaps the lordly ones of the high fairy tradition, they meet something quite different. That's by R.J. Stewart, The Living World of Fairy. She goes in to explain otherworldly spirits and I guess the spirits of the ocean and how you can find your sea fetch. So it's kind of like a totem animal or a spirit animal or a spirit guide of the ocean. When seeking a spirit guide, we don't have to look to mythical creatures and find a range of marvelous sea animals. Some of our potential guides or totem animals for sea magic live entirely in the sea. Some split their time between earthly and watery worlds and some take to the skies and yet the sea is still their home. So I guess maybe a seagull could be your sea totem animal. Animals can act as messengers as well as sources of inspiration, healing, and guidance. These associated with the sea are generally considered wise and powerful. The totem animal or sea fetch can remain with you for your entire life or it can come into your life for a brief period of time to guide you through a particular phase or turning point. Some are merely messengers that have one brief communication or idea to relay. You may also encounter one that may be difficult to deal with at first. This type of fetch usually appears to draw out a side of you that has been ignored. But there's different sea fetches that they go through here and their associated qualities like albatross, a crab, dolphin, manatee, otter, penguin, polar bear, salmon, seagull, seal, turtle, and whale 
I've always really loved turtles. A big symbol of the turtle is fertility, immortality, longevity, opportunity, perseverance. Then the following pages go into them into a lot more detail. So there's like a paragraph about each of them and what they mean. The next section is a practice section, the sea journey. It's a technique that will help you find and begin working with your sea fetch. Following the narrative text given here and ideally recorded in advance, you will enter a meditative state that lets you shift your reality away from mundane thoughts and actions and tap into the network of energy that underlies the worlds of our everyday consciousness. Starting on an imaginary beach, you will travel far beyond. So basically, this is just a little sea journey that you can do. It's, I guess it's like a guided meditation. It tells you how to prepare for your sea journey. First start, you may want to record the following sea journey narrative, then replay it to guide you whenever you are ready to journey. It actually gives you something that you can record to use in your sea journeying or meditative practice. It tells you kind of like what to expect as you read the narrative. It's basically a meditational script here. So if you guys are interested, maybe I can record this for you to uh, use in your own sea journeying or ocean meditation practices. It's like about a page and a half long. And then you can, you know, add ocean waves in the background or whatever to kind of help you get in the zone and get in the feel of that journey. Then it tells you how, uh, what you can do after the journey as you cross back through the threshold, back to your everyday world. And it kind of gives you the opportunity to figure out what your sea fetch is. Maybe your sea fetch presents itself to you in this meditation. And maybe it doesn't. And maybe it might take a couple tries and that's fine. Try it as, as many times as you need to until you find a sea fetch in that realm that resonates with you. So then in this next section, she goes into different mythical sea creatures and beings. It's like a, a page of different sea creatures and myths, which are very interesting. There's a whole section of them here. So there's a little Kelpie. Kelpie originates from Scotland, also known as a Nyx, a Nuggle, a water horse, water bull. And this creature was considered the most ancient and primitive type of mermaid's northern ancestors. The most common form of Kelpie was a gray water horse that offers rides and then threw its passenger into the water, sometimes to drown. Kelpies could appear as human men, but had hair of seaweed. When not throwing riders, they like to stand atop of water wheels, bringing them to a halt. So that's definitely interesting. And then obviously they go into mermaids, mermen. Then there's this one called a uh, ningyo. It's basically a mermaid in Japan. That's what it says right here. Japan. A mermaid. Then uh, a selkie, which originated in the Orkney Islands of Scotland, which are sea fairies that appear as seals but shed the disguise on land. They come ashore to dance for special occasions, as with thrones, stealing a selkie's seal skin gave a person power over it. Various legends portrayed selkies as fallen angels or humans who were guilty of major transgressions. Male selkies were said to take human lovers. Then there's this one called the Usumgal, which is a sea serpent in Sumer. And there's the illustration. Now at the end of this section, it gives you some journal prompts as well. Describe the sensations you experienced with the sea journey. Has the sea fetch made itself known to you? If so, how? What do you believe is its significance for you? Has working with a fetch along with your other sea magic work aided you in finding or furthering your inner path. So this next section, section six, is about the moon, meditations, and everyday life. This basically goes into how the moon is connected with the sea and the ocean's energy. The circular tides of energy move continually through the heavens, the sea, and our body, connecting us and the universe, making us children of the cosmos and the cosmic sea. Astrology began with the observation that the moon was directly responsible for the ebb and flow of the tides, according to Thomas Dietrich. Aristotle believed that the mysterious pulsations of the ocean Ocean were caused by the sun moving the winds of the earth, while Pythias attributed the tides to the moon. The Greeks were not the only people who saw a connection between the moon and the tides. The Celts, the Inuit, and the people of India, China, Japan, and New Zealand all observe the cyclical rhythms. In the South Pacific, the Polynesians linked their moon goddess Hina with the sea by calling her the lady of the ocean waves. And it basically goes into a, like a whole other thing on the tie of the ocean and the moon together. And it gives you a little diagram here. So different tides occur during different phases of the moon. This part's very interesting, so you guys might wanna read this further. It says, the rising tide and waxing moon are times of sending forth, of gaining energy and growth. Meditate on achieving your goals during these times to strengthen your intent and the probability that they will manifest. So for this purpose, create a symbol to focus on by placing a representative object on your altar. For example, if your goal is to further your education or study for an exam, place pearl, 
aka pearls of wisdom, on your altar. If your intent is to draw prosperity, a pearl or carry shell can act as a symbol. Use any type of seashell with associations that correspond with your intention. So basically this goes into the different phases of the moon and what kind of magic you should be doing during those phases with the ocean. Then there's a practice section, which is cosmic sea centering, which seems a little different than the uh, initial sea centering I told you about in the last exercise. Try this sea centering exercise in the light of the moon expanding your awareness to the cosmic powers of the moon and tides. So now you're not only focusing on the, the tides and the sea itself, but now you're bringing the moon and the moon's energies and the magnetic pull that the moon has with the ocean, you're bringing that into play now as well. So that could also increase your magic a little bit because now you have two energies at play and it's also like a magnetic force a little bit. She tells you how to do cosmic sea centering with the moon and the ocean. And there's an equinox tide call that she has here that you could do. Equal are light and dark. With these shells, a circle I mark. Moon above, raise the sea. Shine and flow, bring balance to me. So here's the energy flow of a cosmic sea centering circle. So that's the diagram that she gives. She says, in acknowledging the equinoxes this way, you are expanding your sea magic from inner ocean circle to cosmic sea that also forms a sacred circle through the wheel of the year. If you're anything like me who loves celebrating the wheel of the year, this is an awesome addition because there's no real Sabbath in July, but for me, July is always about mermaids and ocean energy. And it's a nice little extra thing to add to your wheel of the year. Add things and take out things as you like. Not everybody celebrates the same Sabbaths and that's okay. Not everybody celebrates every single Sabbath. Or maybe if you wanted to add in your own Sabbath to your own wheel of the year, maybe you want to do sea magic in July. Make up a name for your sea sabbat. So I think that's a really cool way to be a little innovative and not be so stuck to the structure that was placed in front of us. So as we come into balance at the equinoxes, we create a deep and lasting connection with the sacred world. So then there's a practice here, a seashell meditation, and she gives you some techniques that you could do by meditating with seashells. Then there's a heart chakra meditation that she has here to practice love and compassion. Then there is a seashell mudra meditation. Mudras are hand positions used in yoga yoga and other meditative practices. In the most familiar mudra, the hands rest on the lap, thumb and index finger forming a circle, other fingers pointing upward. It's called the yana. The thumb represents the divine, the index finger is our human consciousness, and the upward finger shows openness to receive. She shows you how to recreate a conch shell through a mudra position with your hand. So basically like that kind of looks like a conch shell. So she basically gives you a meditation that you could do with your hands in this position. So then the next thing that she goes into are um, displays of the ocean in your home, like uh, creating an oceanarium, like I guess like a fish tank full of seashells or other items that you find on the beach that you want to create, kind of like a terrarium, but instead with plants, have it be with seashells and oceanic items instead. You could do a sea garden, so it could be an outdoor place of meditation with just seashells, sand, grass, whatever you wanna grow that reminds you of the ocean outside in your own outside space. And then uh, sea magic for your health, ours and the oceans. She tells you how you can uh, change your diet to eat more ethically and also more healthily. Like salmon is great for omega-3s, but tuna, whitefish, mackerel, herring, they contain toxins. Certain fishes have a lot more mercury than others. She basically tells you how to do your research and eat a little more ethically if you're choosing to eat from the ocean. She makes it a point on this page, when you take, don't forget to give. She says, today, one issue with seafood is the potential level of toxins that it may contain. Pollution continues to be a major problem, not for our health, but for the oceans as well. And I feel, I feel like we all know that, right? We discard too much into the ocean, but we also take too much out. Overfishing has greatly depleted fish numbers worldwide. Buying fish from anywhere in the world, developing nations are suffering economic and nutritional impact. She tells you to choose seafood wisely and stay educated. So she goes on to uh, give you some journal prompts at the end of this section as well. What do you feel when you stand in the light of the full moon? How has the cosmic sea centering expanded your personal energy? What awareness has the shell mudra brought to you? What changes are taking place in your life that you can attribute to working with the sea's energy? So she makes it a point to say, as you continue to explore sea magic, remember to give back. Keep the sacred rhythms of the ocean through your 
receive centerings and meditations, then open your heart, send love and energy to the mother ocean, receive healing energy and return healing energy. And then the last part of this book is in conclusion and it's about the ebb and flow. We live on a big blue marble water planet. We are physically and physiologically connected with the sea. It's our livelihood, and for the millennia, the ocean has fed us and nurtured us. We are drawn to the sea, mesmerized by its beauty and hypnotic rhythm. We respond to the primal call whether we are near or far from the ocean. Our emotions are associated with the element of water, so working with the sea energy can lead us into a deep area of the psyche. With the sea centering practice, we connect with our inner ocean and find the strength to plumb to the depths of our feelings. We also gain a grounded yet fluid stability that helps us cope with our busy and often frantic world. With the power of the ocean supporting us, we can create the physical and mental space we need to define and follow our inner path. So basically she goes into, you know, all the stuff that she covers throughout the whole course of the book and reiterates that we are continually drawn by mystery because we are seekers. Humans are seekers. We're curious. We want to know everything about the world's mysteries, whether it's in space or in the ocean depths below. We want to find out who we are, what we are, and where we belong. There is a deep part of us that needs to search for answers. We long for that connection. So she ends this book with, when we stand on the shore and gaze at Mother Ocean, our hearts open with awe. We feel alive and connected, and we know that we are more than our physical bodies. The purity and power of the ocean gives us the clarity to see and understand understand our journey. The salt of wisdom comes down to us through the ages. Embraced by the circle of the sea, we can find the hidden land, the paradise that exists within our souls. Tenet mare sal sapientia. The sea holds the salt of wisdom. And that's the end. And then the end, she goes into a technique called mind mapping, which is a tool to free the mind's hidden power. It's a non-linear brainstorming technique that calls on our powers of association. It's a great way to organize ideas. It's a great way to problem solve. So basically you start by thinking of a keyword or a short phrase for a seed idea or a question, Write it in the middle of a sheet of paper and then write down words next to it that you associate with that seed idea. Circle it, connect it with a line to the seed keyword. She encourages you to try it during a journaling session when you're working with your feelings. This is an example of a mind mapping session. There you go. And then um, she goes into runes and ogum. Developed in the 1st or 2nd century, the runes are an alphabet used in Northern Europe and the British Isles and Iceland for communications as well as magic and divination. So it basically gives you the rune character, the letter, the name, and the basic associations with each rune. And there's quite a few pages of these. And then the end is just a bibliography of all her sources and stuff that she cited throughout the book. And then at the very end, there's just an index. Also, she has written a few other books. There's one called Whispers from the Woods, The Lore and Magic of Trees, a book called Your Altar, Creating a Sacred Space for Prayer and Meditation. And then there's a little space in the back that you can write to her if you want to contact her or get more information about any of her books. So that's basically it. I really, really hope that you guys enjoyed this little book review. I hope you didn't find it too boring. I hope you found it fascinating like I did. And that's one thing about reading books like this is that they open your mind to uh, new ideas and possibilities. So thank you so much to Sandra Kynes for writing this amazing book. And also I wanna give a big thank you to Mermaid Jade for lending me your beautiful mermaid videography of you swimming down into the depths below. Also, thank you to all of my new subscribers. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, comment, rate, and subscribe. Check all the links down below if you're interested in purchasing this book. Definitely check me out on my website, bohemiamagicstudios.com for more tips and tricks on how to live a magical life. I will see you guys in the next video, and if you have any videos in mind that you would like to see from me, comment below, and I will definitely try to make those happen for you. Thank you once again. I'll see you guys soon. Have an awesome rest of your summer. Stay magical. Stay Mermaidy, and I love you guys. See you next time.